All right, here we go. One of my favorite people is back on Vlad TV again, Lunell. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. You're looking very you, summery man. today in this LA day. It's you know, it's hot outside. Yeah. I did the best I could. I couldn't do all that I couldn't do all that Hollywood powder stuff today. I just couldn't do it. But you know, the tits are out, the top was down. It's it's what it is today. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Well, let's get into what's happening right now. And I want to start with something that actually hits close to home. Uh Literally with you, uh, Eric Holder has been found guilty of killing Nipsey Hussle. And you actually live in that whole area, the whole rolling 60s area of L.A. And you've been there like how many years now? Like 20. 20 years. Okay. I mean, number one, living in that area, how big of a presence was Nipsey? Is Nipsey. Is Nipsey, my bad. His presence is it's looming over the whole area, you know, with all the murals and the people still jamming the music and just the intersection is so important, you know, and if you've seen the intersection and in everything he did and then to also see almost 100,000 people on that corner that were there to memorialize him. So uh, his presence is felt, I think, at least by me, and I'm just one one chick, but I think his presence is felt around there every day, every night. And uh, in um, to answer to respond to your statement about Eric Holder being found guilty of first degree murder, literally it could not have went another way. Yeah, if you know what I mean. It was no surprise. It could not have went another way for many reasons, you know. Like it just, we was not going to stand for anything less than that verdict. That one, not no manslaughter, not no crime of passion, first degree premeditated murder. That's what he got. May he rot in hell. Yeah, I mean, because his, you know, court appointed lawyer tried to argue that he has mental conditions, he was getting electroshock therapy. Nobody give a fuck about none of that. Nothing. Nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody cared about none of that. There's nothing you can say. He did a heinous, heinous thing that floored a whole entire community. Fuck him. Fuck him. During the trial, when he showed up to court with the big black eye and the, you know, his his head cut in the back. And hopefully more is to come. Shout out to all the Mexicans in L.A., by the way, because from what I understand, that was a Mexican dude in jail that, that actually pulled that one off. And shout out to the Mexicans in L.A. for so many reasons. Right. But especially for that reason. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take it. I mean, when you heard uh, the verdict, guilty, how did you feel? Um, You know, with the judicial system and the surprises that they're always throwing at you, you still have to hold your breath a bit. Because even though you know it could not go any other way, evidence-wise, and just for the betterment of the society as a whole, if it had to win another way, um, we're still very, very relieved and glad that justice, whatever that means, was served in this particular case. Um, it won't bring him back. You know, it can't cure those broken hearts of his family and stuff like that. But the fact that he'll stay behind bars for the rest of his life, possibly have feces and urine and every bite of food that he eats for the rest of his life and be probably in isolation due to the fact that the minute he stepped a foot in the general pot, he a dead man. So if that's... The, if that's the torture that we can inflict, we as a, as the jurors and we as a community and as a world can inflict on him, then yay, yay, yay. Um, do you think that we would have had like a, like a 92 LA riot situation if he was found guilty of like manslaughter or something like that or a lesser charge? Yep. Mm. I do. Yeah, I never thought about that, actually, because everyone just assumed he would just be found guilty of everything. Well, but you yeah. can't assume anything when it comes to the police. That's the thing. Yeah. You still have to hold your breath a little bit because they have flipped the script on us so many times. And that's why we've had the riots that we had in the past. So. Yeah, I mean, 
what if Eric Holder was white? Imagine uh, what would have happened in, in that particular trial. I mean, you assume the same thing, but you can't always assume, especially in L.A. You're about to make my head explode at the thought. <laughs> at the thought. <laughs> well, we actually interviewed Cowboy, who was uh, Nipsey's very close friend, who was actually standing with Nipsey when Eric Holder approached them. Actually not. Actually, he was inside. No, no, no. Heard no, no, the no, gunshots. Wait, 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 no. well, oh, he was standing with Nipsey. Exactly. When, when Eric Holder approached, approached them, them initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, no. Yeah, so he was standing with Nipsey. Because I was studying every yeah. thing. I'm right. sorry. No, Go no ahead. problem. So he was standing uh, with Nipsey in the parking lot when Eric Holder pulled up. He said something interesting. He said that when, when Eric started to approach them, Nipsey said, I wonder how this is going to turn out. So as they were talking, he said that Nipsey told him that, hey, I heard there's some paperwork out on you. I haven't seen it myself, but you should you should look into it because that's the word that's going around. And, um, you know, people took that as Nipsey calling him a snitch. Which he did not. And the two of them actually shook hands and it was friendly. And then, you know, Cowboy went into the store and that's when the gunshots occurred. You know, Eric Holder left, came back and, and killed him. And... Uh, Cowboy felt it was important to get the real story out, to to basically say that, listen, this was not a crime of passion. Like, they had a good conversation. They shook hands. They were friendly. Eric Holder went back to the car and then did a premeditated act and came back and killed him. And he actually took the stand, um, I think, multiple times uh, during that trial. And him being a rolling 60s crib. And caught some uh, little hell for it. He caught some hell for it. Me, personally, I supported his decision. I said right there on camera, I said, I, you, you did the exact right thing. Like, fuck all these, you know, little rules about, you know, whatever. That, that's your friend. You know, you're supposed to stand up for him. Fuck that other guy. Yeah, well, listen, man, I, I support your decision. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, whoever got something bad to say about what you're doing, like, that was your homeboy. You know, you have absolutely no reason to help Eric Holder in any capacity. Right. Uh, you know, right. and you're, I'm not, you're, you're, I'm doing, not you're doing the right thing. And as I'm far not as even I'm helping concerned. the prosecution. I'm not helping neither one. You know, I'm just, I'm helping bro name stay clear. Cause bro never said that, you know, had that not been a factor in this whole trial, man, you wouldn't hear from me. I'd be out the way, you know, cause his fate is sealed wherever they set him down. You know, it, it don't matter. Uh, but a lot of people were really hating on me. In fact, he said that more people were hating on him than, than Eric Holder. He felt at certain times. When you look at that situation and him taking the stand, what did you think? I would want somebody to clear my name if somebody said I said something that I did not say, especially if it was something as important as that was going to turn out to be. I would want somebody to clear my name. You know, I don't have a code of the streets type thing. Like, I know there is one, and I'm, you know, I live, I know where I'm at, I know how to carry myself. But, you know, nobody can make decisions like that for me, but me. And he did it. And whatever the consequences were, Nip said stand 10 toes down. So that's what he did, you know. Uh, but, you know, that's their life and what they do. Uh, I don't I can't speak on on any of that. But I I would want someone to, to stand up for me even after death, for sure. Well, yeah, because like certain people refuse to cooperate like for example you know one of the guys that got shot uh he got on the stand and said i don't know nothing yeah does that latham yeah uh carrie carrie latham who, who i actually interviewed who who talked about the situation in our in our interview which but once he took the stand then he didn't want to basically say yeah, that what an happened. incredible waste of time <laughs> yeah pretty much why well, take well you know do three days in jail for contempt if that's if you so bad. Don't say nothing and then go do the contempt judge. Whatever. Yeah, he basically said, "Is that you in the video?" He goes, "I don't know." Were you there? I don't know. Like he basically just I don't know his way through the whole. Well, then he the should case. be suing for they made him like retarded or something that he can't recognize his own self. Sorry, that's not the politically correct word, but that's the word that I used. Also, I had a theory too. You know. He was so jealous. 
Because his, his bitch, don't forget, his bitch was nutting up over the fact that she saw Nipsey and got his picture and came back and bragged about it and shit. And that might have set him off anyway because he'd been jealous of him. That's obvious. Yeah. Jealous people can be right right next to you, looking you in your face. Happens every day, and it happened again. But, you know, something about that little, that little, that little gal set him off too, I think. I think so. I mean, a, a lot jealousy. of, especially when it comes to, to men, a lot of I people, mean, it was a drive back around the block thing. What? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I mean, when it comes to men, a, a lot of the beef, when you really dig into the stories, a lot of times are over a woman. So-and-so's girls messing with both guys, or maybe the girl you with is interested in the other guy, and this, that, and the third. And It happens. We lose interest. Yeah. There's lots of other women out there, man. Don't don't, don't kill somebody over a woman. Seriously. No. Don't, don't throw your own life away and someone else's life away. And like, He shot two other people. Like, Yeah. Over a girl that he doesn't really know all that well. Over anybody. Over anybody. Just don't kill people. Shit. There you go. Damn. There you go. Well, uh, he hasn't been sentenced yet. We assume he's getting life or something very close to it. Uh, he probably will never uh, see daylight again. He's Good. He's probably going to end up being someone's girlfriend. Yeah. At some point. Great. Uh, cowboy uh, called it barnyard visits. <laughs> getting a barnyard visit every so often from another inmate. Uh, and, and that's what it is. Uh, fuck that dude. Uh, you can rest in piss. And, um, you know, it, it's, it would be interesting though, at one point, if he does an interview and he actually says what happens because he never took the stand. I don't want to hear nothing. Really? No. I, I want to hear it. No. I, I, I want to hear what he has to say. He don't got shit to say. What the fuck he going to say? And this is why I killed him. Yeah. Not this is why I punched him in the face. Or this is why I back, backed over him in my car. This is why I killed him. There's nothing you can say. How the fuck are you going to say? I have a sister that's, that's been killed. You think somebody can come to me and say, well, you think I, I care? Why? I don't care why. What the fuck did you do? Look what you did. Well, actually, I do care why they killed my sister. But I don't care what Eric Holder got to say. So there you have it. There you have it. Um, Since our last interview... Monique and D.L. Hughley went at it. When you saw that happen, and number one, you know both people? I know D.L. really well. Monique, I did one interview. It never came out. Bunch of bullshit around it. It is what it is. <laughs> uh, but when you saw that happen, when Monique got on stage and called D.L. all types of bitches and everything else like that over an argument over who the headliner was, even though it was pretty clear that DL was the headliner. I've seen all the flyers and everything else like that. What did you think? I thought it was petty and unnecessary. Yeah. And I definitely have been guilty of spewing hatred towards somebody on stage before, but not in the arena that they were in. You know what I mean? Right before they came on. Yeah, in the th big theater, not some little janky club in Natchez, Mississippi, you know, and with these phones and stuff. Um, you know, I just I just don't get down like that, you know, if I'm supposed to be not if I'm supposed to be the headliner, if I if I come and there's somebody headlining and I'm going before them and they're like new and just popular and not really a vet. Yeah, I might feel, feel some type of way about that. I ain't gonna lie. But if it comes to a peer like DL or Cedric or anybody, Monique or Samoa or anybody, I don't care who's gonna headline because I'm there to destroy shit whether I go before you or after you. And as long as you know that, then do we everybody do their job. I'm just there to do my job. I'm there to destroy shit, no matter if you put me on first. And I don't like that, but I've had to do it. You know, you always got to do shit that you don't want to do. It's business. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you've cussed out other comedians on stage? Yeah. In Mississippi somewhere? Somewhere. Somewhere. 
And, and what was it over? Disrespect. The same thing that gets people shot. Mm. Okay. So how did that turn out at the end of the night? I don't fuck with that person. No. <laughs> Period. And that's that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that. Well, I mean, comedy clubs in general have been a little crazy recently. Uh, Craig Robinson. Uh, I guess there was an active shooting that happened at one of his comedy shows. Yeah, I called him about it. He told me about it. But what happened from his point of view? It was in between shows. And a guy came to the door who had tickets for, it was somebody else like DL, but DL couldn't do it. And Craig came, right? Mm -hmm. So the dude was pissed that he wasn't seeing the person who he bought the tickets for. And then he barged into the showroom and he popped off a few and then sat on the stage and waited for the police to come. Craig and everybody was back in the dressing room, you know, on lockdown. Okay. Uh, was it D.L. Hewley that was supposed to perform? I don't know. Okay, but, but it was, but it was someone like other than, than, than Craig. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you go to a comedy show and the guy that you bought tickets for is not there and you're unhappy with the replacement. Why did you bring a gun to the comedy show? Start, right. So, start so there. in order to why deal you bring with the situation, gun? you shoot up the comedy no, show. No, why did you bring? We got to go back to the house. Well, where, where, where why was it? Why did where, you where, bring? Where, 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 uh, what city was this in? Oh, I don't know. Let's, let's take a look. Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, okay. You know, places in the South, like Charlotte, where they give out, you know, concealed carry permits, like flyers. Some people just carry guns everywhere they go. It's not like, uh, hey, I'm going to take my gun for a reason. That's true. Right? I mean, we're not talking about LA or New York or it's, it's hard to get a carry permit. Down there, I mean, you know, it's almost like yeah, bringing yeah. a wallet. They just bring their gun with them. So it's not necessarily that he brought a gun on some fuck shit. He just may walk right. out with the gun anywhere yeah. and... With that situation, but that goes sometimes. back to the fact that comedy clubs are not secure. Uh, I've not. been saying that for years. We are the least secured entertainers in the industry. Hmm. Sometimes these clubs are so packed, they're no further from me than you. Oh, yeah. And how quick can you get to me? Oh, in yeah. An instant? The, the, the comedy and store in have, LA. The comedy and if store. You have yeah. security and it's not on the stage, by the time they get through the crowd to get to you, you've been, you've been fucked up. And uh, they only have security for the box office. And they don't even stop the people in the audience from talking. If I go to the Comedy and Magic white-ass comedy club down there in Redondo or whatever beach it is down there, if I go down there and start being loud and disruptive, they're going to ask me to fucking leave. But in our rooms, I'm just going to say in the black rooms because these are the ones I'm working, they, they down there leave it up to us. Like, they don't go and speak to people, and if they do, they don't do it, and then there's consequences, like, you got to get the fuck out so you can get a rep that you're not playing. But they that's why we end up saying things like, hey, could you guys keep it down over there for a minute? You know, I always try to do it with some humor because people are drinking and do get in their feelings. Hmm, right. You know? But as I have showed and demonstrated in my previous shows before I got here and the ones I'll be doing after I leave, you don't have to wait for security if you come on stage with me. <laughs> Have you had someone storm your stage before? No, not really storm my stage. I've invited people on stage before, then they didn't want to get off. Or they get up there and they're <laughs> drunk and they want to do some other shit. <laughs> you know, so I've been caught up. Uh, and, 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 and people have approached the stage before, but I've never been, like, stormed like, like that. But but people have aggressively been mad at you and approached the stage. Mad at me and yeah. I'm about to say, uh, no, because I get motherfucker kicked out. Like I'll say it to you once, real nice, and then I'll say it to you nice, but a little stern. Third, you got to get the fuck out, and that is that. That's that. And then the security will come because I stopped the whole fucking show. Hmm. Uh, Ti is doing stand up now. Have you seen him perform? I have not been in the room to see him perform. Have you seen videos of him performing? I've seen some video. Okay. What is your take as a seasoned comedian? 
when it comes to T.I. and his stand-up career? Well, I don't think that he's really trying to make a career of it. I think it's just a bucket list thing. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how would you rate his stand-up comedy? Well, I try not to rate anymore because, you know, then nothing can, nothing positive can come of that. Okay. But I have talked to him personally. Aha. Uh -huh. And he knows, you know, I, I, I have, you know, made a few suggestions here and there. Well, he's a grown ass man. He ain't got to listen to me. None of these comics do. That's why I don't be like yeah. offering up a bunch of advice. But, um, you know, I don't really hear about him doing it that much anymore right now. Yeah, it seems like he kind of eased off of it. Mm. Yeah, he got booed off stage once. But, you know, he he accepted that. He goes, yeah, that's part of it. I'm going to come back and do it again. Um, the thing that was a, a little uh, surprising was, remember, he was doing this show and one of the other female comedians was making jokes about his rape allegations and stuff like that. And he, like, ran up on her. And I think called her a bitch and whatever else. And it's like, well, come on, man. If you do a comedy, you need to take shit like that in stride. Yeah, that you know? was unprofessional. Yeah. I think that he yeah. spoke on that, too. Yeah. Well, speaking of someone who can't take a joke, Will Smith and Chris Rock. That happened since our last interview. How well do you know either of these guys? I don't know Will Smith at all. Me neither. And I only know... Chris Rock in passing. Okay, yeah, I don't know. We we've, we've been in each other's company several times, taking maybe one picture ever. His brother Tony and I, very close friends. Yeah, Tony, I know. I, I've, I've you know, I've hung out with him before. I've gone to his shows before. Uh, cool guy, by the way. Now, when I go to a comedy show, and I sit in the front row. Especially if I get recognized, which happens, you know, part of the time, I know I'm going to get hell in that seat. I know that comedian is going to. Tony Rock actually was one of the guys that, that roasted me this one time. <laughs> Come oh to think boy. of it, yeah, Tony, Tony roasted me when I was in the front row at at, uh, at one of Russell's uh, Russell Simmons comedy shows, <laughs> and that's cool. Like this is what you sign up for when you're in the front row. So Will Smith is at the front row of the Oscars, and Chris Rock starts roasting him. And he actually found it funny in the beginning. If you notice when he was saying the little G.I. Jane joke, he was laughing. And that really wasn't even a roast. That wasn't roasting him no. or her. That was a tiny little jab. Mm -hmm. You know, it was nothing. Nothing to have even any kind of reaction about. Ha ha ha. And let's move on. That's the only thing that should happen. Yeah, but that's not what happened. No. He went on stage, and I think Chris actually thought that this was kind of part of the show, and like he he actually thought it was you know there was no uh, apprehension with Chris Rock when Will Smith was approaching him, and then he got slapped. Hard, hard, bitch slap. Yeah. Well, uh, the part that sort of annoyed me from from a big picture was the fact that you have this you know the biggest award show in Hollywood, period, in the world. You have someone who is a guest of the show, he's a nominee, physically assaults a host and then is able to sit back down, enjoy the rest of the show, then go on stage, accept his award, then go back to his seat again and then go to the after party afterwards and so forth. I mean, you would think that in any other situation, if you assault somebody on stage, at the very minimum, you'd be asked to leave. Yeah, if you'd uh, slap Tom Hanks. Hmm. So you think it was a racial thing? I just think that there would have been different repercussions had he slapped a white man, number one. Number two, I think that everybody probably thought he might go up there and like play strangle him or something like that. And that would have been cute or whatever. The fact of the matter is, once again, security, nobody who ain't got no business on the stage should be allowed to get on the stage, no matter if you're Will Smith or fucking Danny Glover, or whoever you are, if you're not supposed to be on the stage, don't be on the stage. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I think that nobody knew what to do 
because this had never happened before. There was no precedent, you know? Well, uh, that, I mean, no streakers pre- have gotten on stage well, before. Well, there's no precedent for the Oscars, but in terms of live shows and performances, weird shit happens all the time. But not at the Oscars. You not at the say. Oscars. You know, like, for example, the... Where was it? The music, uh, the MTV uh, Video Awards when Kanye went and took the mic from Taylor Swift and, you know... Security. But I almost think, like, the award shows, they want little viral moments like that. Okay, they're going to catch somebody getting shanked on, on camera if they don't get their fucking security up. Like, everything ain't worth fucking clickbait. Uh, Yeah, I feel you. I feel you. I, I was disappointed in the whole situation. And I also felt it was very much of a bully move because... I remember Jazzy Jeff did an interview and said, oh, no, see, Will Smith, he would have done that to, to Mike Tyson. And I'm like, that that's, that's such bullshit. That's such fucking bullshit. Will Smith would not have walked on stage and slapped Mike Tyson. You know, not not in a million years. If The Rock was presenting, Will Smith would not have done that. He if Michael walked. Jai White was on stage, he wouldn't have done that. So you're saying he took advantage of Chris because he's a little guy and all that too? 100%. 100%. That's what I think. 100%. All of it is fucked up. Yeah. It's all fucked up. Yeah. It's not so fucked up that Will's crystal persona has been having cracks in it all this time. That's really to be expected. Nobody's a good guy all the motherfucking time. Yeah. But for him to do that to Chris, that just that just wasn't right. And um, there's nothing to say about it. There's nothing. What the fuck are you going to say? Chris didn't even defend himself. He didn't even hit him back. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that was out of, you know, fear, shock, or restraint. But whatever it is, he did the right thing because just put your hands up and be like, what the fuck is this? You know? Uh yeah, I think uh just the other day, uh Chris Rock, Kevin Hart, and Dave Chappelle mm-hmm. had a show together and they gave I think Kevin was the one who did this. They Dave gave Dave Chappelle a goat. No, they gave Chris Rock. Wait, who did they give the goat to? I, I thought they gave the, the, the goat to Chris Rock. But they gave a goat named they Will Smith. They named it Will Smith. They named right? the goat Will Smith. So maybe he gave it to Chris. That's what I'm saying. I think, yeah, I think Kevin Hart gave How do you get a goat? I want one. <laughs> Go to the goat store? <laughs> Rent a goat? I don't I know. Need a goat. Where, where do you get a goat? Where do you get a goat? I, I know, right? When you're Kevin Hart, you just, you can rent animals. You can rent animals. Well, the thing is, it's not even really comedy. For example, Rolling Loud just happened. And uh, Kid Cudi was performing and he got hit in the head with like a bottle like a plastic bottle or something. And he was like, yo, I'm serious. Anyone else throw something and I'm out. And sure enough, someone else threw, threw something and he was out. Uh, so in general, and now, you know, I feel like all these cell phones being thrown on stage now and everything. I just feel like people are more bold and disrespectful and trying to somehow get a little bit of fame off of disrespecting a performer on stage. It's just, it's more of a thing now. I, I could feel it because- You've had live concerts for whatever, thousands of years. At the end of the day, this is not a new thing. But recently, there's just more of the, hey, we want to be part of the show too. The audience wants to get involved in in really bad ways. Well, I mean, when you talk about things happening on stage with comedians, remember what happened to Dave Chappelle right here at the Hollywood Bowl. You had a guy literally tackle him on stage who I think had like a, a knife or something on him at the they time. They said it was in his backpack or whatever like that. Um, I was with him at the bowl, but not that night. I got uh-huh. to perform there during that Netflix is a joke comedy festival. That's what okay. we were doing. Okay, got it, got it. But um, I, once again, security. How did he get all the way on, on the damn stage? I blame the venue. I'm going to always blame the venue. We're just standing there. So I'm going to always blame the people around me to protect me. If I'm on your land, on your, I blame the venue, period. What do you think about the overall backlash right now in Chappelle with the trans comments and so forth? Because just recently in Minneapolis, they actually canceled, the the venue itself canceled on him. Which I think he just rescheduled to another venue in the city. So it's not like he really got canceled, he just rescheduled. And I'm sure the whole crowd probably went to the new show. But... 
there is definitely a feeling of certain people, certain communities feeling upset over the, the trans comments in some of his uh, stand-up specials, which I don't personally understand because when I watched it, I felt like he was actually telling a story about a trans friend of his and the bullying that she got. Which from her own community. From her own community, which ultimately led her to kill herself. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw, but a lot of people don't take it that way. Well, it's just like the Bible. People take from it what they want to. Mm. They interpret it the way they want to. You know, if you watch the whole thing in its entirety, which a lot of people did not, a lot of people did, then you would see even the trans girl's parents talking about what Dave did really helped her and made her happy toward the days that nobody else would give her a chance to get on stage to do stand-up, and Dave let her do some shows and stuff like that, for better or worse, you know? And um, I can't do nothing about what they feel about what they feel about, just like nobody can tell me what to feel about with, you know, black innuendos and statements and stuff like that. Mm. So I don't really have any comment about that, but I know that Dave didn't miss the money. <laughs> well, yeah, Dave is rich. And I don't know if you saw the uh, the Netflix uh, special he had when he was uh, accepting. Of course I did. Yeah, the whole thing at his, his old high school. He showed it to me before it dropped. Ah, Dave really talked his shit. He was like, you know, I make $60 million. I'm the best of this generation. Steve Harvey do the same shit. Steve Harvey used to do the same thing. Oh, really? Yes. Ah, I didn't know that. He did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And listen, at the end of the day, the shit talking is justified. He can stand behind it. But it's just interesting how Dave is really talking his shit now. Before, it was more of like a humble kind of day. Well, you know, if people even knew what half these people do behind the scenes, Yeah. you know what I'm saying? The philanthropy, you know, the cat does that. Chappelle does. If they knew half of the things that they do that people don't talk about, then they wouldn't they wouldn't talk so much shit. Really. But um I I you know, hey, I'm throwing my hands up on the trans issue because they can feel the way they feel, just like we can feel the way we feel, and everybody can feel the way they feel. And Dave's feels for, for all of that. You know, I think I can speak for him on that. He's, you know, not out to get nobody and doesn't have a malicious agenda. That shit is just stupid. Look, uh, I mean, I've been around trans people before. I've had conversations with them before. Uh, if you feel so strongly about who you are as your identity, that you're willing to go under a knife and actually cut off your genitalia, put breasts on if you're a man... Watch it now, Vlad. Watch well, no, it now. No, no, hold on, hold on. You know, where, you know, present yourself as a woman and so forth. Clearly, you feel so strongly about that and you have to go through and then, you know, going back into society as a trans person where everyone essentially knows you're trans. You know, yes, some people. You got family. Yeah. Going around your family and so forth and dealing with the looks and the stares and so forth. That must mean that you feel so strongly about it that you're willing to withstand all that mm -hmm. based on your personal beliefs. And I respect that. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to say you shouldn't do that. That's stupid or ridiculous. Like, yo, if you've mm -hmm. gone to the extreme because you feel a certain type of way in your beliefs, so clearly it's so important to you and you feel it so down into your fiber and your soul that you have to present yourself this way, I respect how you feel, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to agree with your point of view either, right? You know, I recently had this rapper, Annalie Chapa, recently, who, you know, really believes in herbal healing and everything else like that. I don't believe in that, but we sat down and we talked about it, and we both respected our position, and we found a bit of a middle ground and so forth where we understand each other's things. doesn't mean that we have to go at it just because we don't agree. It's just, it was all fun. It wasn't never like, I, I didn't, I disliked you or it was a disrespect thing. Shit, hell, I see your interviews even throughout the time period when we was somewhat going back and forth. I was still watching your interviews. So if I was a straight hater, I wouldn't even, I'd be like, man, fuck you, I don't want to see nothing, you know? But like, 
it was just it was just it's just fun with me, you know. Just, yeah. And at one point you were like, I can't wait to see you. You know, big hugs, and yeah. I'm like, you and I gave you a hug. Yeah, oh, yeah, we, <laughs> love, we saw each like, other, right? <laughs> like, I'm, like I'm for real, like you know what I'm saying? Like, um, you know, recently, did you hear uh, Basie Gray's comments? I didn't. I, I knew she made some. I didn't. I don't know what she said. This is what she said. She said, "I will say this, and everyone's gonna hate me, but as a woman, just because you go and change your parts doesn't make you a woman." Sorry, and everyone got mad at her, but. I can see her point as well. She's a woman. And changing your parts doesn't make you a woman. It makes you trans. And I get it. If you're a woman and you throw a penis on yourself, I don't really consider you a man. <laughs> you're a woman with a, you know, clip-on penis or whatever it is that they put on you. I don't know. And a reverse I, I, vagina. I, I don't know how they do it, but... I, I don't know, and I don't... I'm, I'm getting uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll let it go. <laughs> we, will, we will let it go. <laughs> My glasses <is> back on. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Pete Davidson. Skeet. Skeet. Skeet <laughs> Davidson. <laughs> Apparently, they're still going strong, him and Kim. Yeah. Um, bit of an odd couple, I would have to say. Kim need a break. She wanted to have some fun. Plus, she didn't want to downsize on the dick, obviously. <laughs> so. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay. Now. Uh... Have you noticed that, like, ever since the Kim's gotten with Pete Davidson, she's kind of gone white girl on us. She's got blonde hair now. She's skinny. That's and... the uh, that's the uh, flip flop that white girls can do. Mm. See, right? Because I mean, this whole time she's done the whole black girl, you know, imagery. I feel in terms of the body and the the style, which was good for the kids, you know, to see that as well. But at the end of the day. Is it really good for the kids? Well, yeah, I they got to embrace their their uh, both of their mm. heritage. Well, they have a black yeah. father. I mean, yeah, but, but they're mixed kids. They're they're half white. They're half black. They have you know, Armenian. Mom don't have to be black. Also, they're, they're mom half is white. Armenian, Armenian, which is white. Black. Well, it could be black. There are dark skinned Armenians. This is true. I had a close friend of mine, uh, you know, Mark Avanessian, who I grew up with. His family was actually a bit, bit, you know. Bit darker than you, actually. Uh, but not just the skin, you know. I mean, I mean, all these European, deep olive-colored, you know, dark-haired people. They they all de derive from us anyway. Well, so. the Moors, right? The Moors who were black kind of swept through. Yeah, Europe, sorry. So you they... know, laid, laid a lot of dick down. <laughs> All, all through the European countries. And uh, that's why you have like Italians with black hair and stuff like that. Yeah. People are so caught up on this racial bullshit. Like, you know, who's what, who's pure, who's not. It's like, yo, everyone just needs to go fuck each other and make a bunch of mixed kids. And No, shit. No. No? No. You don't think so? No. <laughs> what do you prefer then? What do you recommend? I feel like... You know, you can't fall, help who you fall in love with. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that you can love anybody. I don't have Mexican boyfriends. I don't have white boyfriends. All I come to stuff. But at the end of the day, and I don't give a fuck who agrees with me about this, culturally, re religiously, and culinary-wise, it's always best to have people who have the same background as you. Always. Because they if they're Swedish and they marry a Nigerian, they can't sit in the car and sing their Swedish pop songs and the Nigerian finish them for them. It's not gonna happen. Just, you know, if I if I at the end of the day, I just think that at, you know, I've said it before that and this is just my little crazy thought, you know, the integration was where we fucked up at. Hmm. Because when black people was left the fuck alone, we thrived. 
obviously, Black Wall Street, Jones Beach, all the Seneca Village, all these things we was doing because nobody wanted to fuck with us. So we stuck to ourselves and thrived. And it's always because of some racial bullshit that all that shit always gets burnt down, burnt down, burnt down. And I think that the strength of the black man and the black woman cannot be motherfucking duplicated. That's just the way I feel about it. You can love who you want to love. You can be with who you want to be with. But there's just some experiences that other races are going to be able to have empathy for, but you just can't feel it in your DNA the way that we do. That's just the way I said it. Well, listen, I, I respect your opinion. Me personally... All my long-term relationships were not with <laughs> white Russian Jewish girls. Like, well, I mean, I can't blame you for that. You I'm know, just saying. in fact, I mean, almost all my long-term relationships, well, all my long-term relationships were with black women. Right. Uh, I have, I had one relationship with an Asian girl that lasted a few months. But other than that, like the multi, all my multi-year relationships was always with black women. Um, and I didn't, you know, I grew up in San Mateo, California, not a, predominantly black neighborhood. I know San Mateo and yeah. and all that. All that, yeah. And my, I had, you know, I'm an immigrant. My parents are, are, are Russian immigrants. Uh, I didn't, you know, although I loved hip hop and I got into hip hop in elementary school, uh, you know, and I had like, you know, well, I had one black Russian friend growing up in, uh, you know, in elementary school. It wasn't until I went to Berkeley, you know, started living in Berkeley and Oakland that I really had a large group of black friends and, and, you know, really got more into like the culture and, and so forth. And, and that really, you know, my first relationship was with a black and Japanese girl. That was like my first real serious relationship that lasted like, I don't know, like five, six years. Uh, and I, I've always, I've always, you know, since then I've always been attracted to black women. I feel like black women have been really the key, not only to my success, but to my happiness as well. And that's great. And we can't blame you for that. <laughs> We're amazing. You are. <laughs> you, you know, are. black women are amazing. We. I just wish that, I, I, okay, at the end of the day, all this comes from, I wish that more black men felt the same way about us okay. as a whole. We know you like to suck dick. That's why y'all out here sucking each other's dicks. We know the motherfucking that you like these white women. We know that we see it in our face. All we want is for them to love us as well. You can still love these white girls and still love these boys and still, but love us as well. Don't just love them and then leave bitches out here in, in the, flapping in the wind, you know? There's always somebody out there for somebody. Your boyfriend might come from Australia. True, but, if you know, mm. a king, the queen wants a king. That's it. Uh, I mean, speaking of kids, there's a new uh, bill that they're trying to pass that's proposing child support for unborn children. I can't even hear. You know why? Because I'm sitting here saying, Vlad, I always get me to say some shit. It's going to get me fucked up. It's going to get me fucked up. It's going to get me fucked up. That's fine. I can handle it. Proceed. Go ahead. About the kids. What? <laughs> well, like I said, there's a bill where they want men to pay child support for kids that aren't born yet. Unborn children. So if you get a woman pregnant, she said it's yours. That's when child support starts. I guess I need to buy some stock in condoms then, huh? Because they're going to be going back up. Mm. If they're smart. I mean, if you don't want to put a baby in a bitch with a condom on. Shit, it's simple. Yeah, I mean, listen, I don't personally have a problem with that. I feel that if you get a woman pregnant, you need to start helping with prenatal care and, and so yes, forth. Yes, if you did not use a condom and you lally gagged around and got a woman pregnant, then you need to be down by law and do whatever it is that they say to people who do that right. do. Now, That's the, a consequence. Right. That's another thing. People done been knocking up women all over the country with no consequences. No consequences. I mean, your friend Nick. <laughs> your friend Nick Cannon has been uh, on a roll recently. <laughs> well, you just had baby number eight. And I think he's got one or two on the way. <laughs> Well, uh, the, the problem with a bill like this is what happens when the baby's not yours? You think the woman's going to give you that money back? What's been happening when babies wasn't there? The, the dozen billion cases of men paying for kids that wasn't there. Oh, yeah. So? Oh, yeah. No, I, I had a friend that went through that. <laughs> yeah, and so what? what? What happened after that? Well, I mean, actually, wait, who, who went through this? 
recently that I talked to. Earthquake. Earthquake had a baby with a woman. And a couple years later, her boyfriend called him and said, that baby's not yours. They did the DNA test and the baby was not his. And he just stopped dealing with the woman and the baby. And I'm like, well, wasn't there some connection between you and the child or something? He goes, because regardless of that, I have actual children that I need to take care of that are my biological children. So whatever that was, it's not my child. I oh, wish quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody slid in there and got him. Oh, well. Here you have this woman who had what you thought was your son. Yeah. You spent three years bonding with this baby. Yes. Paying child support, but whatever. Money comes and goes. It, but you're the only father that this baby knows. Yes. Granted, the baby's only three, so there's not a, a massive amount of bonding yet, but still there yeah. there is I and, mean, yeah. an emotional part on you. I mean, you're holding this baby and everything else like that. Do you continue any sort of relationship with the baby or the mother after that? No. That's it. First of all, um, the mother, I'm a, you know, I got legal procedure pending against her. Oh. And with the kid, I love all kids. I have nothing against, but I only have time for my kids. R. Kelly, 30 years in prison, and they're not done with him yet. He has more trials in other states, which is probably going to run consecutively with whatever his 30 years is. Were you surprised by that number? No. 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 You thought that was a fair number, 30 years? Yep. He's vile. Have you come in contact with him at all over the years? On a cruise ship once. <laughs> you but and R. He, Kelly on a cruise ship? Yeah, he okay. wouldn't let me in the room, so fuck him. Wait, so what happened? He was performing on the, no, on the cruise ship? No, he was ship? performing, yeah. Okay. He was performing on, on the ship before we even left Miami and then got back off the ship. He didn't go out on the water with us. Okay. So he performed, wouldn't let you in the room. <laughs> That's a lie. That's a lie? That's a lie. Okay. So, 30 years is essentially a life sentence. Because he's, what, in his 40s at this point? Maybe in his 50s? He's in his 50s, right? So he's going to get out at like 80-something years old. Unless the other charges run concurrent. Well, even then, he's still got 30 years. He, he, <laughs> concurrent or not. He still got that 30. Yeah, but is it 30 flat? Because, you know, you might could get 30 and maybe do 18. Yeah. I mean, is it a federal case or a state case? I'm, I'm not sure. sure. It's the feds. The, the feds is 85%. Minus. So, yeah, 85% of 30 years is a lot of years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Boosie went crazy over this. He felt that it was, you know, he knows people that did murders that did, got less than 30 years. And, and did so they forth. pee on little girls, though? Well, he got away with that one. Remember, that went to trial and he won. I don't care. Yeah. I don't the, care. The Aaliyah thing came back up on this trial, though. And that was proven that he was, I guess, got her pregnant, tried to marry her, whatever, and so forth. Um, listen, R. Kelly has a long history of, yeah, of, of being a fuckboy when it comes to this type of thing. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense to me. You would think that after he won his first case that he would just mess with senior citizens from that point on. Well, like, you would think that OJ would have sat down and got him a nice black woman after he got off with them charges, but he didn't do it, and I did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you would think. Well, uh, did you hear about Elon Musk's, uh, Elon Musk's dad? He had his second child with his own stepdaughter, who he had been raising since four years old. Woody Allen. Yeah, this is yuck. This is a whole lot of yuck right here. With Woody Allen, who I also think is disgusting, at least you could say that the girl was Wanted like- Wanted to be with him? Well, no, no. When when she got adopted, wasn't she like in her late teens or something like that? It's not like a four-year-old. I mean, it's both disgusting. Well, let me just say, it's both disgusting, but I just feel it's extra disgusting- when you're with this girl from four years old and you end up having two kids with her. Yes, he's a fucking perv and he should be chemically castrated. Now. Mm. They well, used to do that. They used to do that to us. 
Yeah, they should chemically castrate him. So that means they dip your penis in uh, some sort of solution and then, or, and then you can't fuck anymore? Cut your penis off? Yeah. I mean, I'm right there with you. Two kids by your four-year-old, by, by your stepdaughter who you've raised since four. But she's a stepdaughter. She's not his natural daughter. Doesn't matter. You no, it raising, doesn't matter. You've been raising this baby since four years old only to fuck her when she Wiping gets 18? her little vagina only because you was curating that motherfucker. Yeah. I can't stand, man. If we didn't have to, ooh, you motherfuckers make me sick sometimes. <laughs> I agree. This is some really disgusting shit. Man, this shit. is fucking stupid. Oh, my <laughs> God. Gross. What the fuck? Like, heal yourselves. Y'all heal yourself, please. Uh, well, well, Elon, I think, has like 10 kids now. He's got he more kids. It. He's got like three more kids than Boosie. <laughs> and Nick. <laughs> yeah. You said it, not me. Uh, do you feel like someone like an Elon Musk, who has a whole bunch of kids with a bunch of baby mothers, essentially, at this point, they get looked at differently than someone like a Boosie who yes. has less kids, but he's black. and Yes, you know. yes, of course. How so? Because the rich elite can do what they want. Boosie's rich. He's not elite. Okay. He's black. He's not in the black elite. Like, you know, I see Davis and Ruby D. That's black elite, not okay. little Boosie. But Boosie's popular and he's rich. And he loved the Lord, and I think he's probably trying to take care of his kid. But the white man is, you know, they're in control of the news. They're in control of what goes out. They're in control of the narrative. So it's always going to paint it, paint it different. We get fed these images and shit, and we can't even make up our own minds no more, you know? Yeah. No, I, feel, I just feel like it's being treated a little bit differently. I feel like with, with Elon, he's not being basically drug well yeah drug drug and him. called ratchet or whatever else right for for doing that because he's elon musk and technically he could afford it. but at the end yeah. of the day if you have 10 kids from like six different women yeah you could financially support them but you're not actually there that's raising, what i was raising I've, none of them really you're flying around and he's got a new girlfriend and don't now. think that all these baby mamas is gonna be getting along all all the time there's drama that's i tried to tell that to nick i tried to tell him right i mean i mean but but just seriously but just as listen you you raise your daughter right you've had primary custody your whole life right of her well, most, so, of it, most of it most of it so you understand that it's really not just about the money. It's the fact that you're actually there for that oh, yeah. little human mm -hmm. being every day, guiding that person, you know, dealing with their feelings, helping them oh, grow, sure. yeah. helping them with their homework. You think Absolutely. Elon has helped anyone with their homework? I mean, how could he? He's He got his people he hired to do their homework for him. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm just saying there's nothing cool about this from my point of view. And I mean, speaking of kids, did you, did you watch the, the the viral video where uh, there was a woman with four baby daddies and one of her baby fathers brings McDonald's for just his kid and she like screams at him on camera and everything else like that? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yes. I what know. are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, don't bring my baby McDonald's first. Um... I think that he knew them kids, you know, he could have picked the kid up and took the kid out to go eat mm -hmm. rather than purposely hurt the other kids who would be, that's that's fucked up. And obviously he has a penchant for hood rat because she was a hood rat. She didn't have to approach him like that. You know, She the kids already s can see what's going on and feel, and she could have just, you know, pulled him to the side and why would you do that? And maybe, you know, oh, kids, you know what? I was just playing with you. Let's all go get, you know, or something made it better. But, and then there's somebody filming it. Mm -hmm. well, and I mean, then they got she was filming it. She was like this. I thought someone was filming them. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And then they would, you know, put it on because it's just to shame the guy who, you know, he should have, but, he should have took he should have took his own kid out, or he should have bought everybody 
It's a McDonald's. It's just a kid. How the fuck much is this McDonald's? It's not like he, they, she said, why didn't you buy everybody in the house Bruce Chris takeout? It's fucking McDonald's. Right. You trick. If you can't afford fucking five motherfucking McDonald's meals, don't bring your ass over no goddamn way. Shit. Now? Nah. Yeah, I mean, listen, Boosie said then that he knew, first of all, he felt the guy did it on purpose. Of course he did. That's why I'm saying the other kids, he purposely was hurting yeah. them by bringing this kid. That's fucked up. I Take agree. your kid out to eat or bring everybody some shit and quit being a bitch. I agree. I agree. It's Man. McDonald's trick. There's a dollar really. menu. <laughs> You ain't got a dollar. You ain't got oh shitty ass three three but extra dollars. But that's kind of petty ass man she went to bed with, and said I have your baby with. Why? Oh, I forgot. Cause you can't get abortions no more. Mm. Roe versus Wade has been uh, has been repealed. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen. Boosie said that he, you know, he was that man was obviously being petty. He knew he knows the effect of McDonald's and don't a home play with kids. games with my motherfucking kids. I don't give a fuck if I got seven baby daddy and ten kids. Don't, don't, don't do that. Yeah. Don't fucking play games with these kids. I don't give a fuck what you think about me, but don't involve them. See, and then here I go, and I would have probably stabbed him. You would have stabbed him. I'd have probably stabbed him. Yeah, I could, I, I could understand. You know, and, but I don't need to. You know, I don't need that. But that's probably <laughs> my reaction. <laughs> See, I was okay, and then I flipped. You see how I flipped like that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know that after that video came out, you saw these little like challenge videos where it's like, you know, me trying to, you know, distract the three other kids while my kid eats McDonald's. <laughs> you know, it's all this kind yeah, of Yeah, like, then they make a joke out of your pain. Like she right. might have been a rat, but she got heart, you know? And she but she she just approached the shit wrong. But that's that whole relationship is messy and all them relationships is probably messy. You know what I'm saying? They're they're viral now, and so I guess that's what they wanted, and they got what they wanted, and the kid's still hungry. <laughs> they're probably still hungry right now. Kid's still hungry. <laughs> well, what about uh? Did you see the video of the girl that cussed out her boyfriend because he wouldn't pay for eighteen friends for a birthday dinner? Yeah, she's on drugs. Clearly, she's she <laughs> need to lay out the out the white stuff. Okay, because I don't know, nah, motherfucker. Unless, you know, Mayweather, he be doing shit like that. But if you're not Floyd Mayweather, you know, why am I paying for 18? Because I, I, I can't. And if, maybe if he was a little nicer, maybe he might would have done it. Maybe if y'all were petting him up a little bit and doing all that. But these bitches that get drunk and, drinks and still be snooty. Oh, yeah. You know? She called him broke. Come on, ladies. She called him a broke ass in front of everybody. He shit. Don't, don't no one want a broke ass like you. Like, and it was like, oh. I mean, look, with 18 people, for that whole party, you're talking about maybe 20 people, let's just say each person's bill was $100 because there's food and drinks and so forth. That's about $2,000. Now, if a man is well off, yeah, no problem. But it's the way that you acting, though, honey. Yeah. You know, he probably, I'm sure, could have done that. Hell, I could do that. But it's the way that you acting, you know? Like, you don't have to do all that. It, we need... <laughs> I don't, you don't have to, to do all that, you know, and he's not obligated to do that. Yeah. And and also, I mean, the blame has to go. Like, her friends could have been like, no, nah, it's cool. Like, we'll pay for ourselves. Like, I'm not going to make this man. Rats run in packs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't just see a solo rat run around. Rats like run in packs. Just like that. Right. That is so crazy. That's funny. That's actually funny. You know, you mentioned this before. Roe versus Wade is now repealed on a federal level. And a whole bunch of southern states had triggers in place for just this particular situation where they outlawed abortion right then and there, including Georgia, I believe. Oh, I'm not surprised. Have you ever had an abortion yourself? Yep. Okay. How old were you? Like 18, 19. I think 18 right out of... Right out of... Right in in the uh, junior college, junior college, yeah. Okay, and let me just say this: I've always been pro-abortion, even before I started having sex myself. I've always felt like this is obviously a woman's choice. This is her body. If she decides that this baby is not a good idea right now, and the baby is still like not developed yet, she should be able to do what she wants to do. Well, I mean, you know, it is sort of taking it. 
things into your own hands, you know. Um, and uh, just because I had one, I don't, you know, I I would I didn't never have another one, and um, but luckily I didn't need to have another one. I had a miscarriage and I had a kid. Oh, okay, you know, so but, so you had you were about 18, 19 years old, and what led up to this? Was this a guy you weren't very serious with, or were no, you just too uh, we young and not ready, or too young and not ready? Okay, too young and not ready. Too young and not ready, and not in a serious enough relationship, and financially not ready. There you go. And did the two of you have a conversation about this before you did it? Yeah. And he agreed that you should get an abortion. Um, he wasn't like gun ho, like thank God, but he was like I understand type thing. Yeah, and the the thing is, is that I don't think a lot of people realize this. Is that there are, of course, exceptions and so forth. Yes, there are some women who get pregnant and the man wants an abortion and she's going to keep it, whether to trap the man or there's some money involved or or whatever. And the woman will just go out and make her own decision regardless of what the man says. But I, I'd say that maybe 90, 95% of the time, abortions are usually conversations with the couple. And they both agree that this is the thing to do right now based on both of their lives and their, their relationship. You know, They'll sit down and the woman will say, I'm thinking about getting one or whatever. And the man will say, yes, I think it's a good idea. Or maybe yeah, the man will say. Because it's very rare that a man won't say, yeah, I think it's a good no, idea. Not true. Not true. Lots I mean, yeah. You, okay. Like, let's say you got seven kids. And now you're pregnant with your eighth one. Fuck. We got it. We, we can't, you know. Or um, your boyfriend and, you know, senior prom, everybody, fuck night, official fuck night. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you get pregnant and like, oh, my God, I can't. My parents gonna kill me, you know. Yeah. Or my uncle fucking did it to me, and you know that. Um, but you know when you start becoming uh, employee of the month at the abortion clinic, now you done took shit too far, you know. And just because I've had one doesn't mean that you know. Yeah, there should really definitely be parameters in the in the age of the fetus or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Um. But uh, I definitely think that, you know, it should be uh, not outlawed because you're going to send bitches back to them back back alley uh, abortion clinics and shit like that. Well, not only that, but for example, uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Outliers, uh, a really big best-selling book, he talked about this, where how there's a correlation between abortion and crime. Whereas after they allowed abortion on a federal level, roughly... 15, 20 years later, the crime rates started to lower significantly. It's because you actually took out a lot of people in the population that are going to be born in very bad situations. Right? Mm. Like, if a person has to have a baby and they're a teenager, that child is not going to be growing up in an ideal situation. If both parents are struggling financially and can barely afford to you know, pay their rent on their apartment, you throw in an extra human being in that situation. You know, and this is when like women are forced to do things that they don't want to do. Like how many, how many mothers do you see in the strip club? Do you think that, that was a choice that they aspire to be a stripper when they were in high school? Right. No, they had a baby. The man either wasn't around or didn't step up and they have to go and, essentially demean themselves with a bunch of strange men in order to make sure their baby is okay. And I applaud them doing that, but I don't think that this is an ideal situation for anyone involved. You should, you know, had those women, let's just say aborted those children, they could have gone on to college and actually had a career and had kids later on when they were more stable and they were actually ready for it. But instead, they're in the strip club and, you know, oh, I'm only going to do this for a year or two. And then, you know, 10 years later, they're mm, like that's the... That's one way to look at it. I mean, for sure, you know. Yeah. I mean, what, was was the abortion so traumatic for you that you didn't want to have another one? Because I, I hear that as well. That no. After... No? No. No big deal? No. Thank God. Okay. No. I never looked back. Now, I, I, I had a miscarriage after that. That was kind of traumatic because I worked... All through the hemorrhaging, you know, like I was on stage with like towels Ooh. in between my legs because, uh, you know, still need money. Yeah. 
And, uh, but you know, that that does not kill you makes you stronger. I have a healthy, wonderful, amazing daughter. And that's that on that. I think I could raise one. I can, I can educate one. <laughs> I can keep up with one. But they start multiplying and they, they plot on you and then it's all fucked up. <laughs> Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck got married. She stay in a relationship. That woman could not be single for more than 24 hours. She, she will go find some it. dick somewhere. Spike, Spike made a movie because she got she got to have she it. She got to have it. Jennifer, I mean, look, she went from A-Rod to Ben Affleck. And there like, was not even a, a pause. That wasn't no. even a morning period. Mm. It was like, okay, well, fuck you. What you doing, Ben? You, hey, big I'll be right over. <laughs> Let's go get married. <laughs> she even changed her last name. So she's Jennifer Affleck now? Yes. What do you think the other Jennifer thinks about all this? What other Jennifer? Jennifer Garner. What other Jennifer? Oh, his oh, his ex-wife. wife and the mother of his motherfucking kids. <laughs> what do you think that Jennifer think about this Jennifer? <laughs> Ooh, I'd love to see them in a room together. Messy. Oh, Jennifer man. gotta have it. Mm. Well, I can see a fist fight between those two. <laughs> well, you know, Jennifer Garner did play Oh, that, Boxer, right. right. Yeah, yeah, the Clint Eastwood movie. And right, Jenny right, right. from the block, but I bet she ain't had a good old street brawl in a while. But she might be a wild stallion. Who knows? I don't know. Ooh, I, mean, I don't you know, know who I would put my money on. I well, don't know. I mean, who you got Jenny from the block, you know, from the Bronx. That bitch ain't been on the block in years. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> you still haven't seen her block? I, I want to be on the block, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, her house is nice. Her new yeah. house that she just bought. That's a nice block. I want to be on that block. block. That's the only block Jenny's been on. That'd be interesting, like like, like a, a celebrity boxing match between Jennifer the Jennifers Lopez and the Jennifer boxing match. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, um, what did you think about the whole Johnny Depp uh, Amber Heard trial? I thought that was a mess having that air your dirty laundry like that in public and stuff Ooh. like that. Yeah, she messy and she lost. And people love Johnny Depp, and he's a big old Hollywood movie star, Hunty. Be careful the shit you're trying to break off, you know, sometime. And they love him, and uh, the, <laughs> see what happened. Yeah, you know, one of the books that really changed my life was uh, 48 Laws of Power. Okay? And one of the most important laws that I read was when you win, when you're competing with somebody, and you win... You don't spike the ball. You have to take your wins with grace because if you can continue to taunt the person after you've already won, that's the best way to turn a win into a loss because then you'll start to anger the person who you just beat who's already upset that they lost and now give them a new fire to make to basically have them come back and burn down the whole stadium, <laughs> right? And I feel that in the, in the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard case, that's exactly what happened. She divorced Johnny Depp. She got like 10 million. She won. She smeared him, talked a bunch of shit about him. A bunch of stuff came out in the trial, but she won and she got her money. He went on with his life. She should have gone on with her life, but no, she had to spike the ball. She had to do the op-ed piece in the Washington Post where basically she wrote all about his, you know, her ex-husband thinking, oh, well, I just didn't say his name. I just said ex-husband and talked a bunch of shit about him and, and lied about him and so forth to the point where he goes, you know something? I don't give a fuck how much this trial is going to cost me. I'm going to take this bitch. Let's go, bitch. Let's go, bitch. Let's go, bitch. And look what happened. At the end of all that, she lost $8 million plus the legal fees. Plus the legal fees. All the money that she got from the original trial has, is going right back to him yet again when she didn't have to do none of that shit. And she was like, you know, and I remember in court, they were like, well, she didn't say his name. And his, his says, oh, is there another ex-husband that we don't know about? Because she's only been married once. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, sorry, honey. Sorry, honey. You should have took the money and run the first time. Yeah. You wouldn't have to worry about me. How much you get, $10 million? Yeah, you wouldn't have to worry about me. Right. And she still had a career. I mean, she was in like Aquaman. And she got one now, just probably going to be in porn or something like that. <laughs> so you and Cat Williams were on tour for nine months. Nine and a half. Nine and a half months. How was that whole experience? 
it was amazing and exciting and inspiring and fun and profitable. Mm. Was that the uh, the most you made off a of comedy tour? Both times that I was with him, I would say yes. Mm. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not asking about it, Miles. So I can try and get it. No, back. I'm wouldn't. just saying like this was really like a good business experience for you. But he brings people up like that. Yeah, I mean, when we did it 15 years ago, it was a great experience. Mm. And then to do it again, just to even do it again, was very nostalgic and a great experience. And then we had Mark Curry out there with us, and he Shout was- Shout out to Mark Curry, Oakland's finest. Amazing. Yep. And was ripping shit to shreds. Red Grant, who's been mm -hmm. with us and affiliated for all these many years, been on the road with Cap for even more years than me, of course, wonderful host and started running for the mayor of D.C. position during the tour, which we really supported him and still support him in that. Nice. And because, you know, don't talk about it, be about it. So he's running. Um, and then Jen Thomas, Aaron Thompson, some, uh, you know, we had great DJ. The venues were full. Uh, we started right as Corona started breaking and about to come back, back outside. And um, it was just great. You know, there was no incidents or no latenesses, no cancellations, there's none of that. Well, I saw Kat's uh, Netflix special. I don't know, was the Netflix special similar to what he was performing during this tour? Yeah, that was kind of early in the tour. You know, everything okay. changes toward, toward the end, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of felt like, you know, and I'm a big Cat Williams fan, I kind of feel like with the Netflix special, it was almost like he was trying to be a little more PC than he usually is. You know, the whole cancel culture kind of environment. I feel like he wasn't as hard edged as he usually is. Like I said, that was early in the tour. Okay, so later on, he got more, more sharp with the, <laughs> more brutal. With I the, think with we the all chips. did. Aha. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I like the special, but like I said, I felt like, some of his other stuff I liked a little better, and I felt like he was being a little more careful than he usually is. And, and listen, this environment, I understand. I one one, one wrong subject, statement, suddenly, oh, you're I think canceled. the subject matter changed so drastically that some of the things that we were talking about wasn't maybe as funny as situations as some others have been, you know? Well, some, we, had to, we had to say something about some things during this time, you know? You know, as someone who's been around Cat Williams, what do you think is your greatest Cat Williams experience that maybe you haven't talked about before or people don't know about? Oh, I've said it before. Uh, um, for me, it was flying on a private plane mm. with our friends that we've known. You know, me and Cat, you know, used to ride around in Oakland. Together, we didn't have no money. And you know, now this man has made such an amazing Emmy Award winning career. Mm -hmm. And that he reached back and got, you know, my little round ass out of all the people that he could have gotten out once but twice. And, and with the first time I ever, you know, I couldn't even foresee that. We was happy with the tour bus. You know, we had fun on that. But then you... Combined the tour bus with the plane, with the limos, with the hotels. It was just like fairyland thing, and, and it was the greatest. i never forget it in my life, the first time we ever did it. And so that was, you know, there's many, many other experiences that aren't so superficial that are, are great, mm. too. But that's just one of the things that back then, it just I was so proud of him and so happy for us. It was great. Well, uh, Dave Chappelle is actually... I guess executive producing a new Netflix special for you. Yeah. Has it been filmed yet though? No. Is there a date that's gonna be filmed? No date yet. Okay. Let me know. I'll fly out. Okay. I wanna I wanna see this. I wanna see this in first. I wanna be backstage. I will absolutely let you I wanna know. be backstage for for this for this particular moment. That should you be know? epic. Absolutely. And, and and by the way, we were talking about this before the interview. Uh Earthquake, who is a regular guest on the show, who who I love had a great special on Netflix, but it was just too short. 
It yeah. was just a little bit too short. So so earthquake. The next one you do, just just go a little longer. Crank that hour. Yeah, we need that hour. It was like thirty eight minutes or something like that. Like we we just need a longer a longer set from you, which obviously you could pull off. Yeah, he could, he can do it five times over. It's yeah. just um I don't know what the network type shit credits rolling. I don't know, I don't know. But I'm learning, so yeah. you know, I, I'm finding out why the time is not what we thought that they were. And, um, you know, mine might be 32 minutes. I don't know. I'm going to do whatever the fuck they tell me to do, though. They say, Lynette, we need a hot 15. Bitch, I'm out of 14 and 59 seconds. You know, and also, like, I'm, I'm not really, you know, you don't have to comment on this because these are kind of your peers, but I'm, I'm not a big fan of these comedy specials where you have, like, a headlining comedian on Netflix and then you have a bunch of, like, their friends doing, like, short sets. I, I just, I'm not a fan of the format. You know what I'm saying? It's sort of like you kind of want to see the main person or you want to see the other person doing a longer set. So it's just like. But see, I like I like hosting like that. But I'm the old Diana Ross type. Like if, if I'm hosting, first of all, bringing out bangers, which I'm sure that anybody who does that format is is hoping to do. And then, you know, I want to change clothes every time I come out. So I would give you a show even if, you know, and then sometimes you don't want all the pressure. You want to expose other people or you want to, you know, just do something different mm -hmm. besides just stand there and talk. So yeah. I, I get it. Fair enough. Fair mm -hmm. enough. Well, and you've done some acting since last time. You were in Power Book 2. Uh, I had done that that well, was a while so, ago? Yeah. That okay, was so I, I don't follow, you know, like, I don't follow the show very closely. Like, I, I started watching Power. I got to the end of the regular Power, but then after the spinoffs, I was like, wasn't really my thing. But you had done this, how was it, a year or two ago? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you still a regular on the show or no? If they bring me back, then my character's not dead. My son is dead. <laughs> my son is dead. My character's Your son's not dead. dead. Yeah. Uh, was 50 Cent like on set or anything else like that? No, but Mary J was. Mary J Blige. What was that like? Uh, she um, came to the Paramount Theater one time 26 years ago, 25 years ago. My daughter was a baby. And um, I had my daughter up like on my shoulders. And we were walking toward the stage. The security was about to come tackle me, but this security facing me was like, no, no, let her go, because they knew me in Oakland. And Mary J picked my daughter up and put her on her lap on stage years ago and said, this is the future, yo. This is the future right here, yo. And I was able to tell her that story and to get a picture with her, and she was so humble and so nice. And, you know, I told her even when, my, when Mary J hugged my daughter, her makeup got on my daughter's shirt and my daughter slept in that shirt for like a week. Hmm. You know, and I got to tell her that story. And so it was everything for me. She's the queen. Hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, shout out to Mary J who really is considered one of the greatest female singers of this generation. Period. It's that soul. Period. It's that soul. Period. It's that soul she got. You know, I mean, you could really put her up there with the Whitney's and so forth. It's in the same overall caliber. To be able to then transition into acting and actually pull off these strong roles and to be in all these different, you know, TV series and movies and so forth. And to really pull it off well was like dope. All she needed was her confidence. That's all she needed was her confidence that she could kick ass in any genre. The Mary's everything. And she's every woman for real. Oh yeah. I think um you know, well, her husband, her ex-husband ex basically got child support, you know, from her. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I think it was my interview with Brian Michael Cox, who actually produced um, Be Without You. And I remember I asked him what uh, he thought about the song. And he said, well, it's bittersweet because I know that she wasn't going to perform that song ever again because it was about her ex-husband. And after they had that bad breakup, that song was so tied to him that she was never going to actually sing it again. So it was like one of those things. You know, the energy behind that record, you know, Mary was in a different space. You know what I mean? And the person that, 
that energy was for, um, it, 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 obviously that's changed. The, the energy has changed. So, you know, I know people are emotionally attached to, to, to their records and, you know, I don't know how that record makes Mary feel now. You know what I mean? Because at the time we made that record, she was in a very, very different place when it came to, you know. Well, she was in a relationship. She was, she was married. Yeah, you know what I mean? Now, now she's not anymore. Yeah, and you know what I'm saying? It was not just about, it was not just, it was like the things that went around that song, the story of that song, how we even got to work with Mary. Mm. Um, a lot of it, you know, majority of it came through, you know, it came through that relationship. I mean, do you think that someone's ex-husband deserves alimony if they marry someone much richer than them? I mean, women do it all the time. Let me think about that. <laughs> let, me, let me get back to you on that one because um, women, you know, women done had the babies, though, and stuff. They deserve alimony. She didn't have any babies? I know she didn't. So what does he really need money for? He been living the lifestyle of a fucking king for all these years. If he didn't stack some bread during that time, shame on his ass. I bet you these bitches stack some bread. I know I would. I know I would. I mean, how much did a Bill Gates's wife make? <laughs> you know, you after can't living nobody to them. You know, with a bunch of full grown kids at this point. What about uh, Jeff Bezos' wife? How much? Did, how many billions did she get during that? Well, divorce? just to put up with this bullshit, because they're probably a big snore at the house. She deserved the money. <laughs> she deserves forty billion. Mm, yeah, because he snored a little too loud. Shit, That's right? You can you can get like special ears made for yourself. Like, <laughs> well, uh, since last time Kevin Samuels passed away, I've never seen so many women celebrate a man's death <laughs> as I saw with Kevin Samuels. And I'd interviewed Kevin before. Have you? I have. Mm. I have. Did and I, I could tell you, one? I could tell you that the woman in my life threatened to leave me if Ooh. I ever interviewed him again. <laughs> she said it just like that. There was supposed to be a joint interview with TK Kirkland and Kevin Samuels. Ooh. Both of them, both of them agreed to it. And it was like, <laughs> unless I wanted to be single again. TK. Yeah, she said, you bet not. Yeah. So you are not you weren't a fan either? Well, uh, I didn't follow him, and I only really heard a few brief comments of his that I did not particularly care for. So I didn't really, I wasn't up on everything he said. It was his snarky demeanor that I didn't love and his demeaning, degrading, condescending attitude. I couldn't get past that to really hear what he was saying. So, Yeah, I mean, TK, his thing was like, if TK. a woman if a woman is a little overweight or she needs to get her life together, he'll actually show her how to do it and try to work with her, whereas Kevin Sam was like, bitch, kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, but- You want to hear somebody say what TK said, actually. Yeah. You know, if you have a partner and he's willing to help you and you can right. do things together- Let's go, baby. Let's you know, go. but yeah. that other attitude is not. That's not. That's not warranted. Yeah, I mean, he ultimately died of hypertension. Gee, keep going about his situation when he died. He was with Who a was girl he, with? he just met. What were they doing? Fucking, I uh -huh. think. I mean, he died on top of her. Yeah, he died in that pussy that he talked so bad about. Worst ways to die. <laughs> You know, right. can eat alive by dogs. My husband said he wanted to die like that, and he <laughs> damn near did the last time. <laughs> well, anyways, rest in peace, Kevin Samuels. Uh, I got to talk to him. You know, I got to do an interview with him. Uh, you know, we got his life story, which I think was important. Uh, at the end of the day, he said some stuff that people disagree with, and he also has some some gems thrown in there. And at the end of the day, we're all kind of like that in a certain type of way. I just, where did his license come from? Did there he, is no I'm, license. You know oh, how the was he is. A, a, some kind of medical authority? No, on, he was not authority. Oh. He doesn't have a degree. He's not a clinical psychologist. Yeah, I, I've had these conversations with women. I, I understand where you're going with this. You know, but then again, I never uh, went to journalism school. He, hey, he just was just, he, he found a niche. He jumped in it on social media. Boom. People fell for the fucking okey doke. Like I said, I got better things to do with my time than sit around and listen to a motherfucker I already know gonna make me mad. I don't just 
put myself in those situations. Yeah. Well, like I said, rest in peace, Kevin Samuels. Uh, you know, certain people find found some solace in his message. Other people did not. It is what it is at this point. So what's next for you? What do you got coming up? Well, I'm currently on the road doing my own shows, my own uh, little tour back in the clubs from which it all started, the improvs and the hmm. uh, funny bones and things like that. Uh, the Lunel, fresh out of favors. Fresh out of favors. That's the name of your show? The motherfucking right. Fresh I'm, out of favors. I'm fresh out. What kind of favors were you giving to people before? <laughs> Before I've done a started. lot. I've yeah. done as much for people that people have done for me. Let's say that. Okay. People did me a lot of favors, and I, I did a lot of favors back. I've paid back everybody that I owe money to. Mm. I've paid for funeral stuff and graduation stuff and uh, all kinds of things, trips and, you know, loans and that ain't really loans, you know, and uh, all, all kinds of things. Um, and... I just, it, basically, though, what I'm talking about when I say that is the free ticket hookup thing. I've been giving out free tickets for 30 motherfucking years. And if you've been following me this long, you're not at a point where you can support with a punk bitch-ass $40 ticket, <laughs> then don't come. Because I don't need to be giving out, you know, I'll give out free, the matter of fact, don't ask me. I'll get free tickets and put you on guest list for the people that I want. They'll be like, hey, you be my guest. I just had Sabrina, Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother, come to my show last week. You think I made her buy a ticket? Of course not. I still have the power to give people tickets, but don't be asking me something. Motherfuckers would be like, Linnea, can I get like me plus eight? <laughs> um, no. Me As a plus matter of fact, eight. you can't. Yeah, shit like that. So just don't ask me for free shit no more because my tickets are not. Hell, if you can go see Beyonce, which is easily a mortgage payment, you can take a tenth of that and come see me if you want to see me. So heylunel.com is my website. People can go on there and get my tour dates and stuff like that. I'm also still actively working on developing some shows that... um you know, uh, we're trying to sell. We're constantly doing that. I won't get discouraged until I uh, pass Chappelle's record of he shot 13 pilots before the Chappelle show got picked up. So I haven't shot 13 yet. So we just keep shooting and trying to sell and stuff like this. And um, uh, trying to be the next black woman in late night. Mm. That is my goal. Uh, you know, 11 o'clock. Somebody need to break up this onslaught of white snowfall men that's falling through the white man after the white man after the white man after the white man. And they got two white men named Jimmy. So I know they need somebody else in late night, and that could be me. And one of them is my friend. Hi, Jimmy Kimmel. Mm. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know. Well, I'm going to leave you with this. And this is sort of a cautionary tale. And as someone that, uh, you know, has dabbled in drugs in the past, I think that you might relate to this a little bit. Maybe about 12, 10 years ago, during World Star's heyday, there was a model named Cubana Lust. Very pretty girl, Spanish girl, nice figure. I'd met her once before, very pretty in person. Uh, this, is, uh, this was her back then. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful girl, right? Yeah. She is recently arrested, and her mugshot appeared. This is what she looks like now. Yeah, well, Rick James said a cocaine have a drug, and that meth, and that heroin, and all that street shit. Yeah, I, I remember uh, and all, and all that. Yeah, I, I remember. Um, as we were posting the story and I was kind of looking for pictures of her and so forth and kind of digging into the story a little bit, uh, DJ Kaysley, uh, rest in peace, he had featured her in, her, in his magazine, Straight Stuntin', uh, a couple of times. And I remember there was these posts, there was one in like 2017, another one in like 2019, where he has a picture with her and he's like, does anyone know what happened to her? I, we haven't seen her in years. And there's like an old picture of them like hanging out together. 
And it's like, no one really knew what happened to her. And suddenly this came out and it's like, oh shit. And, and I remember there was a guy um, from Florida who actually DM me and he was like, he sent me a picture of her as well. He was like, yeah, she lives in my neighborhood and she's like, she's panhandling and she's like homeless and so forth. But, but it's like, it, it's crazy the transformation that drugs does on people. It's well, just remember like Maya stunning. Campbell? Remember Maya? Yes. This reminds me of that. This reminds me of that. Now, you yourself were, were addicted at one point. I was using. You were never addicted. Yeah, I was addicted. Okay. I guess. But I was, I was using, but I was one of them functional users. You were a functional addict, essentially. Mm -hmm. How long were you using until you said, that's it, I'm done? Oh, probably about like, I've been saying eight years. Mm. But it was like them late, mid to late 80s, early 90s when like the Coke was really, you know, pure back then and the disco lights was flashing and everybody was having a good time until the Freebase era came along. Then when that came along, that's what really changed the game. And I was in Oakland, California at that time. And everybody was smoking dope from the school teachers to the bus drivers to the people at the post office to the people at the grocery store to your mailman, everybody, everybody. It was a epidemic. Did you see the type of transformations I just showed you? Yeah. So this is commonplace, living that type of life. Well, it wasn't for me because I was still doing shows and stuff like that. That was a problem. I, I had a lot of money and... Not everybody was up late at night when, you know, I get off work and want to kick it. So I put you into the drug crowd. But um, that can happen. I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, that happens. Yeah. I mean, you know, look at Kensington Park in Philadelphia. Jesus Christ. Who is this? Do you know about Kensington Park? No. Who's, what's that? Pull it up. Kensington? Kensington Park in Philadelphia. It's just worse than the wire. Yeah, I mean, swimmers assault staff, vandalize cars in Kensington Park. Do you see the people, overnight. though? Do you see the, any people laying on the street? There's kids that got to walk by that shit to go to school. Yeah. There's, that's within view of people's homes and stuff. Well, I mean, downtown LA is like that. Sure is. Well, remember there was that video of the kids trying to get to class and having to go through people shooting up and everything else like that? And in San Francisco, too, in the San Tenderloin, San Francisco, too. I mean, Hollywood. I remember when we first moved to LA in 2013, I remember I, I lived uh, at Sunset Vine, Suns the Sunset Vine Tower, right? It's a high rise right there on Sunset Vine. Yeah, okay. And at first it was cool, but I remember like, it got to the point where like there was a tent in front of our building that was so big that you had to walk into the street to walk around it. You know, to go to the parking lot, you had to walk into the actual street to get around this tent. And, and I remember, and, and I was just like, okay, I, I'm spending way too much money here to have so to deal this. with this literally in front of my front door. So at that point, that's when we moved to Calabasas. I was like, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing this. But it was like, I mean, it was sad. I mean, and honestly, I, I don't feel, to be totally honest, and I've talked to people who, who have lived in this type of lifestyle and grown up in, in, in these, you know, rough upbringings, and they've always said the same thing. It's not a homeless problem. It's a drug problem. And a mental problem. And a mental problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's the drugs for sure, which brings on more mental problems if you had them before. You know. Yeah, it's uh, it's sad. And like I said, this Cubana Lust thing, because I've, I've actually met her. <laughs> I remember getting into a conversation with her, like around 2010. It was hanging out with Casely, I think. Yeah, I, you know, uh, up in Sue's Rendezvous. It's something, you know, You because all those people down there, they came from somebody's family. Yeah. You know, and what did you do so bad that the family won't fuck with you no more? Or are you turning them away, you know. Everybody has some family somewhere. Yeah, but you know, when I've learned when dealing with people that once they get on drugs, there's really not a whole lot you could do anymore. Yeah, that's that, that true. person, you know what I'm double saying? Like, bolt, double bolt them doors. Yeah, 
Yeah, like once, once you know, and, and I've dealt with people that got on, they'd either been on drugs, I didn't know it, or they got on drugs during the relationship. I can't really tell, but you know, when you start to notice the signs and, and their and their behavior, you can't, unless you want to send the person to rehab and really spend all your and time. And that don't always stick. That, that doesn't always stick. Yeah. You know, I know people have been in and out of rehab their whole lives. I got yeah. family members like that, in and out of rehab their whole lives. Like literally in their 50s, still going to fucking rehab. Like, the fuck. <laughs> I fuck can tell you're not you. fond of that uh, merry go round. No, no, it's ridiculous. <laughs> like, yo, like, <laughs> you're in your 50s now. You have no teeth. Like, like at the end of the day, it's just like, at, at some point, they just you don't just gave give up. up. They you just got to give up. up. They don't give up, and you got to give up. Yeah, too. And, and like I said, th th this picture of Cubana Lust as someone who listen, like I remember watching, looking at her pictures, looking at her videos. She was a really attractive girl, really nice figure, pretty face. To looking like, I mean, she barely looks female at this point. I mm know -hmm. you. You don't know what gender she is. She's so far gone. And, uh, but she's yeah. not alone. You know, there's so many. Like, I watched this, sorry, com competing YouTube uh, show called Soft White Underbelly. Yeah, and they like interview all kinds of fucked up dredges of society and all this. And everybody's got a story, you know? Everybody's, everybody's got, got story. some story. And well, they just can't deal, won't deal. That's the way they're going to deal. That's. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean Delonte West is on the same in the same boat, pretty much. I mean he's homeless, panhandling. Uh, we were supposed to interview him, and then a video surfaced of him panhandling. He got beat up the day before our interview, and he couldn't make it. Uh, and he used to play with LeBron. And in a recent interview, he said he doesn't even remember he plays basketball anymore. It's almost seemed like another world for him because he's a street person now. And why? <sighs> Drug addiction, mental illness, combinations. Self medication, you know, whatever that is, whatever that is. I, I listen. I've been a weed smoker most of my life, but I've never been the hard drug guy. I've tried ecstasy a couple of times. I've done mushrooms. I've tried acid. Never tried cocaine. Never tried heroin. Um, never shot up. <laughs> so, but but really, even the harder drugs like ecstasy weren't really for me. It me wasn't neither. really my thing. I didn't like the way that it took me out for the whole day afterwards. I had too much shit to do in my life. So, yeah, and that's why I buy whatever the fuck I want to because I've blown so much money on bullshit. <laughs> now I'm like, well, at least I can see <laughs> what the fuck I got for, you know. You say you got to sell it a week later for my for my addiction. No, and every time I pawn something, I got my shit back, by the way. There you go. There you go. Lunell, always a pleasure. Uh, congratulations on everything. Congratulations on the tour with Thank Cat you. Williams. Uh, congratulations on some projects that you and I talked about, which we can't talk yes, about on yes, camera. Not yet. Coming up. Yep. Congratulations on your, your future Netflix special. Like Thank I said, you. I want to be there when All it right, happens. For sure. You know, I want free me, me plus eight, by the way. I want, free, <laughs> <laughs> I want a me plus eight pass with, with free drink tickets as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah all, that. They all, want that all that. All that shit. All that shit. That's what it is. Until next time. All right. Until next time. Peace.